Fantastic. So, good afternoon, just. Um, my name is Georgie Harris. I'm an ENT surgeon um, from St Vincent's, and my anaesthetist, Drew Heffernan, also from St Vincent's. So, this afternoon, um, we'd like to talk to you about uh, something called Strive High. So, as an ENT surgeon or a laryngologist, um, my ideal sort of surgical environment is to have complete access to the larynx. Drew's objective, however, is more for um, the cardiorespiratory stability while I'm operating to control the airway. So what we'd like to talk to you about this afternoon is how we combine the two with a tubeless, spontaneous ventilation anaesthetic technique. Now, the idea of a tubeless anaesthesia is, is not new. And a lot of you will have heard of the Thrive technique. No tube, paralysed, and maintaining oxygenation with high flow oxygen. Now, I do like Thrive, but for me, using the laser, I worry about laser fire. Little has been said about the tubeless anaesthesia with the adult patient spontaneously breathing. Drew and my predecessor, Dr Ian Cole, have been using such a technique for over 20 years. But it wasn't until this article in 2017 that it was really described and called Strive High. So to highlight this technique that we use all the time, I'd like to introduce a few, to introduce a few patients from my recent operating list. So the first patient is a 41-year-old woman with chronic cough and dysphonia. She has idiopathic supraglottitis. So all investigations by all the various ENT surgeons, immunologists, respiratory physicians have all been negative. So Drew, for this patient, I need access to her supraglottis for examination, biopsies, injection of steroids, and I will be using the laser to debulk those false cords. The second patient is a 36-year-old female who's fit and active, uh, who has noticed a, de a deterioration in her voice over the last four months. She initially thought it was due to vocal overuse, but her GP is also a little bit worried about asthma. <laughs> okay, so this slightly unexpected vocal cord polyp needs to be very carefully removed and I will be using the blue laser. The third patient is a 30-year-old woman with idiopathic subglottic stenosis. So she developed stridor in her first pregnancy, it resolved, uh, but it returned with her second pregnancy. And two years later, she remains uh, stridulous and short of breath on exertion, um, with, yeah, with any exertion. So Drew, I will need to be doing all my work below her vocal cords. So these three patients all show very difficult pathologies, requiring complete access to the various layers of the, of the larynx. And I do use, need to use laser on all three of these cases. Hopefully I'm on as well. Um, yeah, that second patient reminds me of the last time I ever said to my anaesthetic nurse that people with no top teeth are easy to intubate. And when I got down there, she had a large polyp flopping in and out of her vocal cords. Um, we just use some pretty simple principles, or I use some pretty simple principles, which I've now been using for a very long time, to uh, enable my surgeon to do these operations, to enable Georgie to do these operations. Um, and what I thought I'd also do was I'll discuss some of the principles involved which extend past just how do you do uh, an anaesthetic so that someone can laser or subglottic stenosis, because most people in this room are probably never going to be doing that. Uh, the first part is to keep the patient breathing. And as Georgie said, the guys in the UK paralyze their patients, lovely still vocal cords. Um, and with this magic uh, high flow nasal oxygen, you can keep someone oxygenated for 30, 40 minutes. Um, how do you keep the patient breathing? Well, that's easy because everyone breathes all the time. What you have to do is not stop the patient from breathing. So as long as you don't stop the patient breathing, they will continue to breathe. And that means that you don't give them paralysis, you don't give them 
high dose opioids, that includes remifentanil, alfentanil. If I do use fentanyl, I use it in 10 mic aliquots, tiny, tiny, tiny doses. Um, and I don't use big boluses of propofol. So this technique was designed for someone with a pinhole stenosis of their subglottis. I need to keep the patient asleep. We can't do all this with them awake with the giant suspension laryngoscope because it's incredibly stimulating having a suspension laryngoscope pulling your tongue forwards. And Georgie would like to be able to do the operation and not have to chase things around. So you've got to keep the vocal cords still. Um, and surprisingly, that's actually really, really easy. Can you have the next slide? Um, if you just start with a little bit of propofol, I cheat slightly. I don't put all the patient's weight, age, and everything else in. I just use a standard 40-year-old uh, um, 70 kilogram person that the pump gives me, and then I titrate to effect, and I start low at about two mics per mil on TCI, and I basically give a graded propofol infusion. If you do that, the person starts off awake and talking to you, they slowly lose consciousness. Eventually, they become deep enough for me to put a laryngoscope in. Remembering the suspension laryngoscope was invented by uh, an ENT surgeon, Chevalier Jackson, and then stolen by the anaesthetists afterwards. Like, well, what are those things? Are oh, they vocal cords? I've never seen them before, said the anaesthetist 100 years ago. Um, I generally put in my laryngoscope at about six mics per mil, and you can see that's about 100 mils an hour, and I keep going until the person tolerates my scope. If they, if they tolerate my scope, which was stolen from the ENT uh, scopes from Chevalier Jackson, then Georgie will probably be able to put her scope in. I spray the vocal cords with some local anaesthetic. I'll talk a bit more about local anaesthetic in a second. Uh, and, and the molecular, that just enables um, the cords to stay a little bit more still and the scope to be in without too much drama. All right. Um, one of my take-home messages. When you put in Chevalier Jackson's suspension laryngoscope and all the various other ones, and you can see the vocal cords, if you can see the vocal cords and someone is breathing, they will not be hypoxic. Okay, so one of my take home messages is that most cases of hypoxia are because the tongue falls backwards onto the pharynx. It's one of those things that everybody knows, but it still gets called things like laryngospasm. It still happens in the recovery, it still happens on induction of anesthesia, it still happens on awakening from anesthesia, where my colleagues say, oh, there was laryngospasm, um, and I did this and I did that. Hypoxia is almost always the tongue on the back wall of the pharynx. If you can move it forwards, either with a suspension laryngoscope, or with jaw thrust, or with a Goodell oral airway, or with an LMA, then the patient will no longer be obstructed and they will continue to oxygenate if they're breathing. If you stop them breathing, they will also um, become hypoxic. So I'm an absolute believer that getting the tongue off the back wall of the pharynx, either with something physical or with this manoeuvre, is the key to maintaining oxygenation of the patient at all times. You can see the stats up here, 96%. Um, this technique was developed before Thrive. So this is a, a humidified high flow oxygen system that goes up to 70 litres per minute. I started off with just nasal prongs 20 years ago because that's all we had. Uh, I have an oxygen blender. Um, I don't use this as some sort of magic tool to make the person uh, well oxygenated. I use it as a support and most of the time I'm at 20 litres or less. One of the things that happened in the UK study that uh, Georgie looked at the patients after, they've got a lot of sinusitis. When you go up to jet engine level, 70 litres a minute, um, people get sinusitis and all sorts of runny noses and complications from the Thrive system. And more importantly, you don't need it if you uh, keep the tongue off the back wall of the pharynx. The problems come if I let go and I go and I start doing my 
um, Sudoku and all the other things that I do during my normal anaesthetics, uh, if George is not ready to take over the airway and the jaw falls backwards, the patient quickly becomes terribly hypoxic. Now, I mentioned um, local anaesthetic. I spray the cords once we see them with either cofenalcaine fort or with 10% lignocaine, lidocaine or xylocaine. Um, the cofenalcaine fort's great, but it does cause tachycardia uh, and uh, can cause some hypertension. I put patients into AF with that. Uh, lignocaine is very safe. However, it contains um, banana essence, menthol, uh, saccharin, and goodness knows whatever else. So I've thrown a whole lot of stuff in to make it taste nice, which means that if you spray the vocal cords with 10% uh, xylocaine, lidocaine, lignocaine, you almost always get coughing and you get laryngospasm. One of the reasons that I think we should move away from the word laryngospasm, laryngospasm, the cords snap shut if you spray them local anaesthetic. However, the patient doesn't die. You can look at the cords, you can see them. The anterior two-thirds of the vocal cords, Georgie tells me, are pretty much the talking part of the vocal cords. The posterior two-thirds, a larger area, is the breathing part. And almost always, even when they're snapped shut, there's a little space there and some gas can come in and out. There was talk about oxygenation, ventilation, all these words. I think words matter. And I like the word laryngospasm for what it is, but I don't like it when we actually mean upper airway obstruction in the tongue. Uh, everyone knows about the triad of fire. We almost always have some fuel. If I'm running 100% oxygen, it's great, but it means that any time anything uh, catches fire, and that can be charred tissue, it can be a surgeon's glove, it can be a little piece of um, one of the various packs that someone has put down, in 100% oxygen, that will catch fire rapidly, and it's considered an absolute never ever event that the patient catches fire while you're trying to operate on them. So I use, in almost all cases, 21% oxygen, and most of the time, in fact, I turn off the gas for two minutes beforehand. Um, you can see here, that little ball is down at the bottom. This is on 21%, so even if I did want to give a little bit, um, it's only gonna be at room air. And this is a patient we did last week, and we stopped at 15 minutes because the operation was over at 15 minutes. But it's 15 minutes of room air with the patient completely deeply anaesthetised, uh, possibly running about 120 mils an hour of propofol, well saturated on completely on room air. So despite the, the talk being titled Strive High, I don't use this except as a backup. Very occasionally, the very, very obese patients, usually above about 120 kilograms, uh, or people with end-stage lung disease, do need something else. This will settle at some number, but if that number is 78%, we all get a bit antsy. It's a little bit like sitting on a slippery dip. If anything goes wrong, you very quickly fall to the bottom, and you can run a little bit of oxygen, say, somewhere between 21 and 30% and a little bit of flow to enable you to actually keep these patients asleep and alive. So Drew's happy because he knows that he's oxygenating and I'm happy because of the conditions that I get. So this is a video from that third patient um, and I'll just let this play. So you can see, first of all, I can access, I can, I can assess if there's ever any lesions on the vocal cords. I've actually got amazing access to those, sort of, um, those lesions and the vocal cords aren't moving. Um, but for this patient, I was able to get my blue laser um, down to that subglottic stenosis. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the laser, it's, um, it's a really nice laser we use a lot in laryngology. It has a very flexible fibre, uh, 300 or 400 microns, and you can get right down, because I'm using a, a, um, a camera, I can actually get right down to the level here where I'm actually using the laser. Um, so very uh, easily accessible and very safe because we're not, we don't have the high flow of oxygen happening. And you, you briefly saw there the vocal cords essentially not moving. Sometimes there's a very small amount of movement. So if George is operating on the vocal cords, again, it's a very simple technique and incredibly safe. Again, at the end of the procedure, George will take away her suspension laryngoscope under vision. And if we just stop there, almost 
invariably the patient will obstruct, their tongue will fall backwards and they will rapidly become hypoxic again. So airway surgery, particularly laser airway surgery, is incredibly important for communication between the two of us. But it's a very similar dynamic to that between me and uh, the recovery nurses or um, if I'm intubating and I get someone to hold the airway for me. This constant communication, are we opening the airway? Is the tongue coming forwards? Is it safe? Who's looking after it at all times? Uh, some, oh, sorry. Sorry. But... Some people um, uh, that I've taught to use this technique put an LMA in at the end because it's easy and then uh, the recovery staff, again, are used to looking after LMAs and have to say, oh, look, you're going to have to sit here for 10 minutes doing dual thrust, which can cause pain and problems. And uh, this is a patient where we put an LMA in and you can see that the CO2 was essentially normal, um, well oxygenated. Very, very simple sec technique. I'm a simple soul. I like to be able to just uh, set things up and, and uh, stand back a little bit. I don't like things like jetting where I have to be there the entire time. Uh, last slide, we've done over 500, or I've done over 500 now with Georgie and with Dr Cole, including 150 laser cases. The only failures we've had, I think we had one person who was like 180 kilograms and uh, had to tube that person. It was just too much. And uh, one other person with end stage, end stage um, lung disease on home oxygen. We managed to do the procedure, but then essentially had to tube them afterwards to get their CO2 down. But those patients are incredibly difficult to do, no matter what your technique. Um, and this technique, as I say, is easy, uh, simple and safe. So I think just to, uh, just to summarise, I think um, the technique, so whether you call it strive high or whatever, is a very, um, you know, is a tubeless, spontaneously breathing anaesthetic technique. It has excellent uh, conditions for, for airway sort of surgery. So for me, there's minimal vocal cord movement. I have complete access to the larynx. Um, and also, with a lot of the other techniques, if the patient does drop their oxygen sort of sats, you often have to stop this procedure to allow ventilation to, to bring the oxygen sats up. So with this technique, there's no stoppage, so I can just sort of get on and do what I need, what I need to do. Um, I think the biggest thing for this is the, the lower risk for, for, for airway fire. So we know with Thrive, it is a, it is a risk and it has been documented. Um, we can turn the oxygen right down, so that risk is a lot lower. Um, the CO2 increase is, is minimal. Um, and as Drew sort of said, it's a fairly simple technique, but more importantly, both the surgeon and the anaesthetist are very happy. Um, and we're very happy to answer any questions. I don't know if time permits now, but we've, we've got our contact details up there, so very happy to, uh, to have a discussion about this if anyone would like. Thank you.